Hello everyone and welcome back to the Kohi Game Engine series. Today we are finally going to tackle the renderer subsystem and we're going to get started right now. Really quick though, I would like to take a quick second and thank the partners of the channel, AR Slayer and Wenshang. The partner is the highest tier of supporter on the channel. And so I just wanted to say thank you to our partners as well as our other supporters that are listed here on the screen. So if you're interested in supporting the channel, there are a couple ways to do that now. First off, I have channel memberships available. You can access that by clicking the join button below this video. I'll also provide a link to a video that I have describing the memberships. And I also have a Patreon page, which is patreon.com forward slash Travis Roman. Thank you all very much for your support. It is greatly appreciated. Okay, so perhaps one of the most important subsystems of an engine is the renderer subsystem. It is not the only subsystem. There are going to be many surrounding it and working with it. But without a renderer, obviously, you don't have much of a game engine. So with that, let's begin with some basics by defining exactly what the renderer subsystem is. So what is the renderer subsystem? Quite simply, it's a software or hardware process that generates a visual image from a model. That's technically the definition of it. And what that generally means is we will take certain pieces of data like geometry that you see here on the screen. And this consists of vertex data that ultimately is used to make faces that is ultimately used to display various objects in a three dimensional world. This also applies to 2D uh, as well. And so what you do is you take that geometry ultimately and you apply some textures and lighting to it and it makes the world a little bit more immersive. And then you wind up with a finished product. By the time you're done, you add some effects to it, uh, things like water, um, fog effects, various post effects, things like that. And you wind up with uh, your final created image. Now this is a very high level abstract version of it, but it should suit the purposes for this series so far. So our renderer subsystem is actually gonna be composed of two pieces. There is first going to be a renderer front end, and there's going to be a renderer back end. So the front end is responsible for meshes. It manages textures, things like materials, which is the various properties of a particular surface, whether it looks like wood or perhaps metal, glass, uh, and all the various properties that go along with that, such as shininess, roughness, etc. And it also allows us to configure things like render passes, which we'll touch on, a bit later, as well as something that we're gonna call a render graph. And a render graph is basically a configurable graphics pipeline. So that is going to be something that we'll touch on quite a bit later in the series, but for now, uh, this is these are just some of the things that the front end handles. This is by no means an exhaustive list. So the front end deals with all those things. So what does the back end deal with? Well, the back end deals with lower level stuff, specifically renderer APIs, such as Vulkan, OpenGL and DirectX. You may have heard some of these in passing. If you're new to game development, you may not have heard them. And basically what those are, they are APIs that interface directly with the GPU drivers or your graphics card drivers. And they are ultimately what allows us to draw images to the screen using our graphics card versus using just software like you might see for uh, Windows, for example. And so there are a couple of options available to us. Historically, you had OpenGL and DirectX. OpenGL was sort of a cross-platform compatible renderer API that was primarily used on Linux. It was used on uh, gaming consoles, things of that nature, whereas DirectX was primarily used on Windows and later the Xbox. And so while DirectX is limited to Windows and Xbox, that is a significant portion of the market share in the gaming world. So it might seem a little bit crazy to limit yourself by using DirectX, but uh, DirectX is probably one of the most common ones out there in terms of APIs. OpenGL, of course, is super common as well, but we'll get into that in a little bit. More recently, there was something released called Vulkan. Vulkan is a new renderer API, or graphics API, if you will, 
that allows a little bit more control. And we'll get into some of the aspects of that in a moment. But Vulkan is gonna be the one that we're going to use. However, our renderer subsystem eventually will support all three of these. So we're gonna build it in such a way where the back end can abstract whatever one of these APIs we're using. And the front end will not have to understand that whatsoever. And that will allow us to swap these out if we want to for specific platforms. For example, if we wanted to work on um, porting this to work with the Xbox, we'll need to use DirectX for that. So that would be where we'd want to do that. Or we might want to use OpenGL on a platform that doesn't yet support Vulkan. Okay. So along with render APIs, because that's the biggest piece of the back end, the other bit that it handles is what we're going to call GPU upload. And that is basically taking the data from the meshes, textures, and materials, so forth and so on, and actually feeding those to the graphics card via the render API. So the front end will make a call into the back end saying, hey, I've got all this data that I need sent to the GPU so that we can use it to render. Go ahead and do that, and the back end will take care of that under the hood. It'll also contain things such as draw calls, which you may have heard of um, if you've read any uh, game development literature out there, uh, a lot of people refer to draw calls, and that's actually where they're made, as they're typically made at the render API level. Okay, so that is a very, very high level of what our renderer subsystem is going to look like. There's going to be a lot more that goes into it than that, but um, I just wanted to provide sort of a bird's eye view on that. So next, let's talk about the renderer lifecycle. So when I talk about lifecycle, I'm talking about how the renderer is instantiated from the time the engine is started to while it's running and what it does when it's running, as well as when it should shut down. And so the renderer lifecycle, of course, begins with initialization. Initialization, of course, happens when the application is starting up. So typically this would be, we will do any Vulkan or OpenGL or DirectX setup that needs to be done before we can actually do any rendering that would be handled uh, during the initialization phase. Once everything is initialized and set up and ready to go and the engine is actually ready to enter its game loop, which we've already been over, the next thing um, that will happen is we will enter into a phase of a frame by frame loop. And within that loop, the first thing that we're gonna do is prepare the frame. And frame preparation can be things like calculating various bits of lighting data that need to be sent over or uh, camera angles, things of that nature. Uh, there are certain things that you have to do before you actually begin to render the frame. Uh, and then you, after that, uh, we'll go ahead and set some state on the GPU. So that would be things like uploading any data that's changed from one frame to the next, such as camera angles, lighting, model animations, things of that nature. And we basically, at this point, want to get the GPU ready to render the actual next frame. And so this would actually include us making all of the draw calls as well. And once we've completed all of that, then we go ahead and we present to the screen. And that is when you actually see that frame appear in the window of the application. And so this presentation to screen is the final step for a specific frame. After that, we check to see if we are still running. And this is sort of the end of the loop. So the prepare frame is the beginning of the loop and the check to see if we're still running is sort of the end. And so if we are still running, then we loop back to prepare the next frame and continue on within this loop as long as we're still running. If we are no longer running, in other words, a shutdown command has been sent, then we're going to go ahead and call any shutdown processes that are required for the particular renderer. So that pretty much is a high level of the renderer lifecycle, at least on the surface. So we're gonna handle this in a multi-phase approach. And this is going to have a lot more than just one or two phases because there's a lot that goes into a render. And we're going to be sort of touching on the render and then backing out of the render to touch on another part of the engine that we need to add um, something to. Uh, such as a job system, something along those lines, and then we'll come back to the renderer. So we're actually going to be going in and out of the renderer multiple times as we go. Uh, and that's going to be sort of a recurring theme throughout the rest of the series. So phase zero 
is going to be the scaffolding process where we set up the actual renderer itself at the front end and the back end and just get all those things kind of hooked up and in place and we're also going to instantiate Vulkan and uh, we're going to clear the screen to a solid color and that is all we're going to do in phase zero so with a Vulkan that's quite a lot more work than you think it might be and so that is why I'm drawing the line there for phase zero it gets us to a nice point where we can see some visual progress but at that point we will need to um, actually back off and handle some other things. So that's phase zero, next comes phase one. Phase one is adding support for static meshes, textures, materials, and some basic lighting uh, using the Fong lighting model. And that's gonna give us some very basic lighting, but it'll give us something that we can sort of look, look to and begin to work with uh, without having to write a whole bunch of fanciness in the renderer, right? It'll give us some basic lighting that we can play around with dynamically and uh, build around that. So phase one is going to be um, a pretty large, substantial visual update. Uh, probably this will be the largest of all, to be quite honest. Phase two, we're gonna simply add some features here. So we're gonna add renderable textures. I'll touch on what that is at the time uh, when we go, to head, go ahead and tackle that but we are also gonna be adding things at, such as terrain, a uh, skybox, dynamic skybox with a sun and a moon and all that, as well as uh, water effects as well. And so uh, there's not many things in that list, but the things in that list do require quite a lot of work. So that is gonna encapsulate phase two. Phase three is gonna be any post effects. And we're actually gonna start making the pipeline configurable. And so, for the first three phases, we're gonna kind of hard code some things just to get things up and running, right? Um, because no matter what you're developing, especially uh, the larger the project, sometimes you just have to temporarily hard code things just to get stuff up and running. And then once you figure out how all the pieces are gonna fit together, then you can go back and make it configurable. And that's what we're gonna do in phase three. And as part of that, we're gonna add uh, post effects. So post effects actually rely on render rule textures. So um, if you'll notice these, each of these phases sort of builds on the last. So that's phase three. Phase four will be adding advanced lighting and um, that's known as physically based rendering or PBR. And uh, that in and of itself is going to be quite a lot of work because we are also gonna make that configurable as well. And uh, so that is also gonna sort of continue this start configuration uh, pipeline or configurable pipeline rather. And so that's all I have for phase four. And then anything phase five plus is basically just gonna be us adding features, right? And so we are going to um, kind of come and go from the renderer uh, as we continue on with this series. So as part of this multi-phased approach, as I mentioned before, work will be needed in between phases. So for example, phase one is actually gonna require a math library, which we're gonna to have to build. So we're gonna to have to step back from the renderer, build our math library, and then we'll be able to continue to phase one. So our renderer development will be ongoing, but in tandem with the rest of the engine. So um, a lot of series tend to sort of focus on the renderer for a long time and stay there. And I don't wanna do that with this series. That's why I wanna sort of back go back and forth uh, between the two. So that is pretty much how our multi-phase approach is gonna work. Okay, so you might be asking at this point, why are we using Vulkan? What are the benefits to this? Well, OpenGL has been around a long time. It's kind of dated. Uh, it's loaded with tons of deprecated functionality, which granted you could just not use that, but uh, it's, it's also got a lot of things that it handles under the hood for you that aren't necessarily the most efficient in terms of the way that modern GPUs work, right? Like, as I mentioned, OpenGL has been around for a lot of time. Uh, it actually has a lot of state that it manages for you under the hood, and that's not always going to be the best thing, right? It doesn't always offer us the amount of control that maybe we want. And so, uh, there's also a ton of OpenGL tutorials out there, but there's not as many um, on Vulkan in terms of building a game engine around Vulkan. And so uh, with those reasons, we're going to kind of go the Vulkan direction. Another reason is Vulkan is designed to be super lightweight um, or a quote unquote thin abstraction layer to the GPU driver. So um, it's actually so thin that it doesn't even have really uh, much debugging capability 
out of the box. And I've got an asterisk there because um, there are extensions that you can use with Vulkan that actually come with the SDK um, that you can turn on, that we will be turning on to uh, debug, but Vulkan by itself is super thin, so thin that it does not actually contain debugging by default. So um, when we go to actually turn all that stuff off for our release builds, it's gonna be lightning fast. Another reason is cross-platform. So out of the box, it supports Windows and Linux. Mac, I have a asterisk next to because it uses something called Metal but there is something called Molten VK that we will be using to make Vulkan work on a Mac. So I have an asterisk there. We will tackle that down the road, but uh, we will be supporting Windows and Linux right off the bat. We even also get some consoles out there, such as the Nintendo Switch that has Vulkan support. So if at some point we want to port to the Switch, uh, this engine will actually be able to do that. Of course, that requires you signing off on NDAs and a whole bunch of other stuff with Nintendo to actually get that. But uh, this technically, technologically speaking, will support that. Uh, Vulkan also has both a C and a C++ API available uh, right out of the box. Uh, there are other bindings for it for other languages, but provided with it, uh, C and C++ bindings are available. Now we are gonna be using the C binding, that's why I have that bolded right there, but if you're following along in C++, you could use that as well, although even in my C++ projects, I tend to use the C API anyway. So as I've mentioned before, Vulkan offers greater control than GL, but it comes at a cost, and we'll get to that in a moment. But it allows the application to manage everything, so uh, the application manages memory and not just memory on the actual CPU side of things, but also on the GPU side of things. So uh, it manages memory, it manages synchronization between uh, multiple threads. The application has control of all that stuff, plus a lot more. And so we want that for our engine uh, because we are going to be multi-threading things. So uh, that is something that Vulkan just supports out of the box, whereas OpenGL, things get a lot trickier with that. Okay, so these are the benefits. Are there any drawbacks? Well, yes, it requires a lot more upfront code and effort. It does get easier down the road, but upfront there are a lot of co lines of code required just to get Vulkan up and running and something rendered to the screen. And we're talking in the thousands of lines here. So one thing that I am going to make note of is that the series is going to make a bit of a shift after this video where I will not be explaining every line of code but I'll like be explaining blocks of code because if I explain every line of code we'll be here for three years so with that said expect a little bit more ground to be covered uh, because we are not going to be explaining every line of code I expect that you guys will sort of pick up on the patterns that we've used thus far and um, we'll be sticking to a lot of those patterns going forward. So another potential drawback is it's more complex and difficult uh, than OpenGL specifically. And this is especially true for new graphics programmers. OpenGL allows you to stand stuff up very quickly, very easily, and get something up and running and sort of play with it uh, a lot quicker. Vulkan definitely is not that way. Unfortunately, um, that's just sort of the way that it was designed out of the box to give the application maximum control comes at a cost of complexity. So um, for any of you that have not tackled graphics programming before, this is going to be a lot, I'm not gonna lie. Um, and I'm gonna do my best to explain things along the way, but there are gonna be topics I'm just gonna gloss over because I'm not gonna be able to cover them. Um, however, I'll do my best to link you to resources along the way that hopefully will help out. So along with these two things, this means that it's a lot easier to shoot yourself in the foot. <laughs> but you know, if you're using C++ or C, you're kind of used to that already. <laughs> um, the raw pointers and such uh, allow you to shoot yourself in the foot very easily. So. If you're at least somewhat comfortable with C or C++, you're kind of used to shooting yourself in the foot all the time anyways. I'm sure we'll do it on this series many, many times. So get used to it. It's your place of comfort <laughs> is being under that bus called Vulcan.
So, uh, those are pretty much the drawbacks. Um, anything else that I could mention really stems off of those things. So, that is pretty much it as far as that goes. Now, for a quick overview of how Vulkan works. So, first and foremost, I would be doing a massive disservice if I did not start off with stating that you need to stop and read the Vulkan spec. So, the Vulkan spec is a and I will actually put some footage. Okay, so the Vulcan spec, as you can see, is quite a long document, and I'm not exaggerating here. There is a lot of information in here, but you cannot successfully work with a Vulcan without at least reading, I would say, most of this. I'm not saying you have to stop and read the entire thing, but it would behoove you to at least read through the first probably nine or ten sections at a minimum. Um, yeah, probably probably all the way up until, I don't know, section 14 or so. It's a lot of reading. I would say do it in conjunction with this series, but don't just rely on this series for all of your knowledge of Vulcan because Vulcan's a massive thing. There's a lot of documentation here and this is the spec that we are gonna be programming to. I will be referencing this a lot throughout the series. So definitely don't take this series as a full Vulcan tutorial because it is in no way, shape or form meant to be that. Okay, so along with the Vulcan spec, let's talk a little bit about how Vulcan works. Well, Vulkan first uses an instance. It's called an instance, or you can think of it as the installation of Vulkan on what's called the host. So the host is basically the PC or potentially console that you're working on. And a Vulkan instance is based around a particular installation of Vulkan on that host. So the instance is used to stand up devices and Vulkan exposes one or more devices because every machine has some form of GPU these days. Uh, so a device can be thought of as a GPU. Uh, it's not explicitly that, but um, we'll get more into detail on that as we go forward. But for now, you can just think of as a device as a physical GPU. So each one of these then in turn exposes queues, and these are hardware queues that the GPU uses to process and execute commands. So it's a first in, first out, um, and you basically feed the commands uh, into a queue, and that is how the graphics card executes them. Now, commands handle everything from uploading data to our draw calls. So I realize that this is a vastly, vastly simplified overview, but I think it'll work for now. Um, we are going to be touching on a lot more concepts than this, uh, when it, especially when it comes to presentation and actually drawing to the screen. But at least for uh, starters, this is what you need to know, right? So we start with an instance, we stand up our devices, uh, we get from the devices cues, which we can use to execute commands, commands handle everything from data to drawing, okay? So with all this said, where then do we start? Well, in the next video, we are going to be scaffolding the renderer subsystem. So that's gonna be setting up the front end as well as setting up some of the back end stuff. We are going to be integrating it into our application at relevant points. So that's everything from the initialization and shutdown to where it actually shows up in our application's game loop. And then we're going to be standing up the back end and the Vulkan instance, right? So uh, the Vulkan instance, of course, won't do much in terms of visuals, but uh, it will be the first Vulkan code that we will write. So in the next video, we are going to actually write some Vulkan code. Uh, I realize this video is a little bit different where uh, we're not necessarily writing any code, but I thought it was pretty important to sort of give a preview of what we're gonna be building because otherwise, if we're just flying blind, it's probably not gonna make a lot of sense to you guys, especially if you haven't done any graphics programming before. So 
uh, with all that, that is going to wrap up this video. Uh, and the next video is probably going to be substantially longer simply because uh, that is where we are actually going to start setting up some of the big pieces. So if you guys like the video, please toss that a thumbs up. If you haven't already, consider subscribing. Click the little notification bell there to get notifications when new videos in this or other series drops. And I will see you guys in the next video. Thanks for watching. Bye.